Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum and welcome to the Ramadan edition of the Suleiman Ravid show. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala accept our efforts in this noble month of Ramadan. May Allah grant us the strength and the energy to maximize on this great month. Uh, during this month on the program, we are going to be touching on topics that some may deem to be uh, somewhat less spiritual, but in reality, they are of utmost importance. Normally during the month of Ramadan, when it comes to programming in, in Muslim media, the topics are very spiritual or they talk more on the directly spiritual topics, if I can put it that way. But some of the topics that we are going to be touching on uh, during the program in the month of Ramadan are those aspects that uh, actually impact on our state of spirituality. And it impacts on our spiritual state, it impacts on the level of our faith and Iman, and it uh, impacts on, on how good a Muslim we actually are. So those are the kind of topics that uh, we are going to be discussing on the program uh, during the month of Ramadan, inshallah. And for tonight's program, we are talking about something which has pretty much afflicted almost everyone in, uh, in the Muslim community, and that is gossip. You know, sometimes we talk about it with uh, humorous undertones, we joke about it, but it's a very serious affair and it has a great impact and, and implications for the perpetrator as well as the victims in this world and for the perpetrator in terms of uh, the akhirah and the year after as well. And it's something that uh, we need to tackle head on and we need to have a frank discussion about. And uh, we have uh, a guest in studio with us this evening. It is none other than Maulana Ibrahim Bam, Secretary General of Jamiat al Ulama South Africa. Maulana, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh and uh, welcome to the program. Uh, wa Alaikum Salam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh and Assalamu Alaikum to all the listeners. So Maulana, when we talk about gossiping or ghibat uh, as uh, we commonly refer to it, what do we actually mean? What, what is the definition from a Shari perspective? What constitutes gossip? Well, even before that, let me just speak about this whole aspect of communication in the tongue. Allah in the Holy Quran says, خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. A very amazing aspect. I created humankind and I created human beings and I've given them the ability to communicate. Now, it's amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a beautiful surah, which is sometimes referred to as the bride of the Holy Quran, خلق الإنسان, I created human being and out of all his faculties, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the faculty of speech. And the ulama tell us the reason for this is that this tongue and this means of communication is both a boon and a bane. Mm. Well, without it, you cannot do many good deeds. Without it, you can't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala says, اُذْكُرُ اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance. Uh, our iman is not complete without the tongue. There are two aspects of iman. One is to do with the heart, which is to affirm uh, something, tasdiqun bil qalb, to affirm the essentials of deen with the, with the heart, and to affirm it, and then to speak about it and manifest it with the tongue, ikrarun mm. bil lisan. So we cannot become uh, true believers until we affirm our kalima with the tongue. Uh, so there are so many aspects, you know, the aspect of zikr, the aspect of tilawat, the aspect of amar bil ma'roof and nahi and il munkar, the aspect of good counseling, the aspect of advising people. So many good deeds which are attached to the tongue. Yet at the same time, many of the aspects that are negative in our community, in our society, in our deen, is related to the tongue. Mm. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu once, after relating many good deeds, and so Mu'adh, do you know what is the, the root? And the, the basis of all of that, it is your tongue. So Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, said in amazement that Ya Rasulullah wa la ta'ala question us with regard to what we say with our tongue. You know, obviously, you know, many a times we have this type of attitude that let me say whatever I want. Mm. You know, it's the freedom of speech. Like how we say today, that is the, uh, one of the slogans of the time that we are saying. So let me say whatever I want, whatever is my heart, let me blurt it out. So Nabi Karim so well, so. told him, O oh, Mu'az, may you be humble and humiliated. Don't you realize that majority of the people that will go into Jahannam will be owing to the indiscretions of their tongue? Hmm. Majority of the people that will go into Jahannam will be owing to the indiscretions of their tongue. 
And of course, there's a very famous hadith that every day, uh, at the beginning of the day, uh, all the organs of the body, they plead with the tongue. In istaqamta, istaqamna. If you remain steadfast, we will be remain steadfast. Mm. If you go astray and you give commitments to do wrong, then we are going to follow. So whether the legs or whether it be the, the hands. So if the tongue gives a commitment to do something that is wrong, the other organs of the body follow. So this, you know, this tongue is such an amazing thing. It is either the cause of great amount of blessings and rewards, or it becomes the means of great amount of um, torment, anguish, uh, and great amount of warnings that have been sounded with regard to what uh, the ulama have said about the gunas and sins which are commonly committed by the tongue. And then, of course, there's a very beautiful saying in English, I'm a master of what I have not said, mm. and I'm a slave of what I have said. Yeah. So as long as I have not said something, uh, I am the master whether I should say it or not, or to what extent should I say it. But the moment I have blurted it out, and the moment I have said it, I've got to live by that. So I'm a slave with that. So I got to live by that. I got to defend it. Sometimes you have to defend the indefensible because what the tongue had said. So it becomes a great amount of, um, you know, a means of bones, a mean of bone and bane. And one of the greatest harms of the tongue is the aspect of backbiting. And yet, as you had correctly said, Molana, in your introduction, the backbiting and gossiping is something that we hardly regard as something that is a guna and sin. Mm. We don't take it. Um, you know, with the seriousness that it deserves, we take it very lightly, and there's hardly any conversation and gathering of ours which is not um, dominated by gossiping and backbiting about something. Yet, the spiritual harm of it is so great. You asked with regard to the speaking about the definition, mm. and um, one day the Sahaba asked Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al ghibah Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Do you know what is ghibat?" And the Sahaba said, "Allah in His Rasul knows best." And Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi said to narrate and to speak about your brother something that if he comes to know about it, he would dislike it. Hmm. To speak about your brother or to speak about your sister or to speak about someone in such a way that if they come to know about it, they will dislike it. Now, while this is, and of course, Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had one of his miracles was Jawami Al Kalim, comprehensiveness in speech. That is just one sentence, but its definition is so broad, so wide, that it covers many aspects. The great scholar Imam Nawawi Rahmatullah Ali in his Kitab Al Adhkar, very famous book on it, and he has made mention, mentioning about your brother something that he would dislike includes what concerns his body. Mm -hmm. Right? Concerns his religious practice, his worldly status, his physical appearance, his moral character, his wealth, his children, his servants. All of that is included in that. Even up to his smile, the way he looks, the way he talks, all of that has been made mention as part of. So in the definition, speaking explicitly and implicitly. Now the very famous example with regard to an implicit indication and gesture he is Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, one day not knowing, you know, and, and referring to Hazrat Safiya radiallahu ta'ala as she was very short. Mm -hmm. So referring to her appearance, that she was very short. And Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at that indication, at that gesture, and said, Oh Aisha, you have done such a thing by this gesture that if it was mingled in with the ocean, it would contaminate the entire ocean. Yeah. That aspect is also part of backbiting and gossiping. That although nothing was said with the tongue, but the indication, the gesture was such that it falls part of the broader definition of backbiting. Well, I think you've, you've raised two important points. You've spoken about the role of the tongue, and it reminds one of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Akhtaru Khataya Ibn Adam Filisani. The majority of the wrongs that we perpetrate in life is linked to the tongue. And uh, you've also mentioned there the definition of, uh, of ghiba, anything that the person that, uh, what you call it, would dislike if they come to know about it. Mm. Now, t taking the point that you mentioned that uh, we, we don't take it seriously nowadays, we consider it to be something that is almost normal, almost acceptable, everyone is doing it. Can you perhaps enlighten us? What, what does the Sharia say in terms of the gravity and what are some of the warnings that have been sounded out in terms of uh, those who, who are guilty of gossiping? Well, firstly, let us look at the Quran, which is the highest form of our evidence and the highest form of our guidelines. 
uh, in the highest form of our guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala yakhtab ba'dukum ba'dha. Do not one of you backbite another. Right now the Quran has given us that do not commit backbite. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us the definition. And look at how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala speaks about the harms, and Allah Taala says, "Ayu hibbu ahadukum ayy akul lahma akhihi maitan fakarihtumu." Would one of you love, or would one of you like that they would eat the flesh of their dead brother? So Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show the perniciousness and the evil of backbiting and gossiping has actually, Allah Ta'ala has referred it and given an example of eating the flesh of a deceased corpse. Hmm. And for Allah Ta'ala says, definitely you would dislike it. Who would ever like to eat the flesh of a deceased corpse? And that is the reality with regard to it. And this cause is a Sahih Hadith of someone who was fasting and they found it very, very difficult to complete their fast. When normally it was not like that. And they were, that was brought to the attention of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said yes, that they were being backbiting. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, throw up what you have. And they came pieces of flesh. And this was a practical example of what the reality of backbiting is. You know, this is something that is, you know, what more can we say with regard to it that the way Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has referred to it that أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَعْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ Then of course there is a hadith الْغِيبَةُ وَشَدُّ مِنَ الزِّنَى that the ghibat is at times even more severe than zina. Now of course uh, we must not take that uh, you know lightly and of course there is an explanation with regard to it. We know zina is one of the greatest and heinous uh, sins that can be committed by a human being. But in this way it is more serious and therefore I said in a way it is more serious because uh, of this fact that when a person commits adultery, he realizes and there's always an aspect that I have done something that is wrong. He regards it as wrong. Mm. He regards it as something that he has done, that he has transgressed the laws of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, when he commits and he does backbiting and gossiping, and he's never mind not regarding it as guna and sin, there is a sense of relish, yeah. you know, a sense of achievement and fulfillment. I did something. And of course, as part of that definition, I must add, Molana, that uh, uh, many times people, when they do speak bad about someone else, they, when they are reminded that you are backbiting, you are speaking bad about someone uh, in his absence, which if he knows he would dislike, which is the definition of gossiping and backbiting, many a times we would respond by saying, but it's true, it's true. Mm. So the same thing that Sahaba said to Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what if what we are saying is true? You know, whatever we are saying is true. So Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if it is true, it is backbiting. Because if you are lying about the person and you are saying something and you are relating an evil attribute or something that is negative about your next Muslim brother, sister, or some other person, hmm. that is not true, فَقَدْ بَحَتَّهُ Then you have slandered him, which is even worse than, uh, uh, worse, worse than backbiting and gossiping. So this definition that I am prepared to say to him on his face, whatever I'm saying is true, well, firstly, what if you are saying it, it is true, then that is backbiting. That is a very definition given by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about backbiting. And of course, if you normally say, I'm prepared to say it to him in his presence, then go and do it. But don't speak behind his back. Hmm. So if you, if you wanted to and you say, I can, if you want, I can go and say it, then go and say it. And that you can go and say it is a different matter. Whether you should be saying it, not saying it, how you should say it is a different matter. But by you saying that I'm prepared to say it to him in his face does not absolve hmm. you of the Guna and sin, and it still falls under the definition of backbiting as has been defined by none other than the greatest human being, the Prophet of Almighty Allah, our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Severe warnings indeed sounded out in the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in as far as gossiping is concerned. Time for a break. When we come back, we continue the discussion with Mawlana Ibrahim Ba. Jenny, when I'm a
Welcome back. So we're talking about gossiping and the impact that it has on our spiritual state, how severe a sin it is, even though we have trivialized it because it has become so widespread and it has become so common. Uh, people even say that uh, even the pious nowadays uh, gossip. Before the break, Mana Baum spoke about uh, the role of the tongue when it comes to gossiping. Mana explained to us the, the definition and some of the Quranic verses and the hadith of Rasulullah uh, on the topic. Now, Mulana, moving on from there, I suppose the key question is, if we want to get to the root of the issue, why do people gossip? What inclines them to gossiping? What are some of the underlying issues, the root issues? Is it sometimes boredom? They don't have anything better to do with their time. Is it sometimes jealousy and, and hatred towards a particular individual that you kind of get a sense of fulfillment by talking bad of that person? Well, there are, there are various reasons. And perhaps that is one of the, the aspects that Islam has taken uh, such a strong stance against gossiping and backbiting and why there are such severe warnings with regard to it. Because all of the motives that are behind it, by and large, all of them are flawed and all of them are motivated by aspects that are not uh, noble. For example, one of them would be a sense of superiority. So I am better than another person. Uh, you only backbite about someone if you regard yourself as superior to them. If you regard yourself as equal to them, we are all human beings whom Allah Ta'ala has created as weak. So if I'm going to speak about the, the evil and the negative aspects of another person, what about my own, or my own aspects? And of mm. course, that is one of the reasons why we have been told not to backbite. Because the aspect of fault finding, and bear this in mind, that each and every one of us have got faults. So if you start looking at the faults of another person, where does it all end? It will just be a cycle of, of finding faults and finding faults. So what, what has been the Islamic position with regard to looking at the faults of another person? So we find that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, al mu'minu mir'atul mu'min. That a mu'min is a mirror for an ex-Muslim brother. Mm. A mu'min is a mirror for a, uh, his brother. And a mu'min is a mirror for another believer. Now what, what is the definition and role of a mirror? Now a mirror would identify your scars in your body, would identify the aspects that needs to be rectified if there's a piece of dirt that is upon your clothes and you don't see it and you look at the mirror, you would be able to remove that speck of dirt. Uh, if there's a scar or something, there's a dirt, you need to, the mirror will tell you that there's a piece of dirt that is upon your face. But the mirror will not go and broadcast it to anyone. And that is a re reality. Yeah. If we find, for example, there's someone who has got a fault, then we go and speak to him about it. We give him good advice. We don't go and broadcast it to everyone. And then, of course, the aspect of man satara musliman, that the general guidance of Islam with regard to seeing the faults of another believer is not to go and broadcast it, but it's to conceal it. Man satara musliman, he who conceals the faults of his believer, believing brother, of his believing sister, then Allah will conceal his faults. And whoever pursues the faults, says the hadith in Jami al tirmidhi whoever pursues the faults of another person, Allah will pursue his faults. And if Allah Ta'ala pursue your faults, Allah will disgrace you, even if you remain in the confine of your homes. Mm. Allah Ta'ala will, will expose those faults. So this is a very important point. Firstly, when we do see the faults of someone, we take the example of Amara, right? So we speak to him about it, we bring it to his attention with goodness, with akhlaq, with conduct, but we don't go and broadcast it. Then the other aspect is man satara musliman, that you conceal the faults of another person. And then of course, if you see the faults, Ali radiallahu anhu's very famous, you know, statement that uh, let your own faults prevent you from criticizing and looking at the faults of others. And he who makes much of the faults of others will would regard his own faults to be insignificant. But he who looks at his own faults and regard it to be serious, and which it is serious, more serious than the faults of others because you are going to have to account for it, mm. right? Uh, you're not going to account for the faults of another person. Then if you regard your faults to be insignificant, you will make much of the faults of others. But if you regard your own faults to be of serious nature, you would not have the time and energy and... Uh, the need to go and look for the faults of others. So one of the aspects, of course, the aspect of fault finding. Then the, coming back to the aspect of superiority, you only backbite about someone if you regard yourself to be superior to them. Mm. And Allah Ta'ala has very clearly has made mention in the Holy Quran such a beautiful aspect. One of the, the ayats that always 
you know, inspires and motivates me so beautifully. Who a'lamu bikum? إِذْ أَنْشَأَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ Allah knows you. Oh, human being, Allah knows you so much that you don't even know yourself. Mm. Allah knows you when you were still scattered in, in, in the earth. Uh, when uh, the atoms and those aspects which form the nutrition of your parents were still in the earth. Huh? Then when that became part and parcel of your parents' nutrition, and then when you were in the womb of your mother, Allah knows you from that time before your conception. Allah knows you when you were conceived. Allah knows you when you were still in the wombs of your mother. You have not made your appearance in, in dunya, in this world. Allah knows you. Don't praise yourself. Mm. Allah knows who has taqwa. So who are we to regard ourselves as superior than others? When Allah says, don't regard yourself as superior, I know who's got taqwa. Who are you? Self-praise has got no recommendation. So that is one of the aspects that is harmful. Then uh, the other aspect of for why people gossip is because of jealousy. So you, je you backbite about a person because you can't see sometimes his good. You can't see sometimes the favors Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon him. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala am yahsuduna al-nas ala ma atahum Allahu min fadli fa subhanahu of the holy quran surah nisa Allah ta'ala says are you going to be jealous about what Allah ta'ala grants someone Allah is not going to grant someone something on the basis of whether you regard it as good or you don't regard it as good or whether you are happy not happy but that is you see this these are the reasons and every reason is flawed. Mm -hmm. The aspect of superiority is flawed. As I said, فَلَا تُزَكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ The aspect of hasad is flawed because Allah is not going to give someone favors based on your whims and desires. Sometimes it is anger and frustration. You can't see the good. You can't see the progress of people. So out of anger, you start uh, you know, speaking and gossiping about someone, backbiting. Sometimes it is revenge. So someone might have done something to you, now you in return go and do something to him. Sometimes it boredom. So these are some of the reasons, inshallah, we can even go more further with regard to it. I think a key point that you mentioned, Imana, is all of the motives are flawed. So as much as the perpetrator may be thinking that he's getting back at, yeah. the, at the victim of the gossip, in reality yeah. he's only exposing his own flawed uh, character. Yes. And also everyone that he might try to justify that I'm doing it for this, Another aspect that people be, they feel that they are bored. So when we are, you know, around a braai fire, you know, <laughs> and when we are finished with a braai, now we are having our desserts and having our tea. Now what happens? Let us speak bad about someone. Do you know what happened? You know, uh, do you know what happened? And normally when people, you know, are, are empty within themselves, then they normally, you find sometimes very amazingly, Monana, is this that uh, normally when there are things to be done, then people don't roll up their sleeves to talk about issues that needs to be done. Mm. You know, constructive things, people don't speak about it. But all of a sudden, when there's a fitna, when there's a gossip, there's a scandal, then all of those people who normally are, you know, nowhere to be seen when constructive work needs yeah. to be done, they are in the forefront. Do you know what happened? Oh, yes, this one did this and this one did that and the affair and counter affair. You know, amazing. Uh, من حسن الإسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه Amongst the beauty of a person's Islam is he leaves that which has no, which does not concern him. By what a other person is going to do, he's going to account for his deeds in front of Allah. What are you going to be sitting and gossiping about him? So this min husn al-islam al yani. Then another aspect is curiosity. Uh, another thing to fit into a company. This is a very, very common thing. Yeah. So, you know, everyone is taking out juicy you know, scandals with regard to another person, how can you be left behind? Especially when there is, you know, the majlis is hot, the gathering is hot, and everyone is saying that I have to say something, I have to say something, and everyone is saying something, and now you say, I don't understand, man, everyone is bringing out something, I've got this that is in me, and I'm somehow or the other, I'm just keeping quiet, man. How long, how long can I keep quiet? <laughs> and then, you know, just to fit in, or to become the toast, or become popular with regard to the gathering that is going on, you also go out and, you know, go and speak about things, which unfortunate, but that's what actually happens many a times. Well, in terms of the impact and the consequences, I suppose you could, you could say there are like three uh, role players, so to speak. One is the perpetrator, the person gossiping, 
his own credibility comes into question when you, when you continuously gossip about people. And then there's the spiritual implications. Then there's the obvious, the victim of the gossiping and, and the implications and consequences for that person. But also the passive observer. Many times people just like to be in those gatherings, even if they're not contributing. They just want to listen to what's the latest and they just like to listen to stories about others. What, what's the impact and what's the consequences on society and, and, and our own spiritual state when it comes to gossiping? Very interesting, Moana, because you see, just as a principle, a general mm. principle, we cannot get away with this argument or this justification that I was just in that gathering, mm. you know, uh, and as such, as I was in part of that gathering, uh, I, I didn't see anything. But in today's time, we all know that if you are part and parcel of something that is wrong, uh, maybe you might not get the same, but you are also going to be counted and you will get a lesser sentence or you will get a lesser charge, whatever it is, but you would be part and parcel of that. Now look at this general principle with regard to this aspect that many people say, well, I was only in the gathering. I, I didn't take an active part. I was a passive listener. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ Seven supara of the Holy Quran, Surah Am. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ يَخُوذُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا Whenever you see people who are disputing about the commands of Allah, they are speaking against the Quran and Hadith. فَعَعْرِذْ عَنْهُمْ Then turn away from them. Turn away from that gathering. حَتَّى يَخُوذُ فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ Until they start speaking about another topic. وَإِمَّا يُنْسِيَ نَكَ الشَّيْتَانِ If for example, you started sitting when they started objecting to the Quran and Hadith, and shaitan made you forget about leaving that gathering, فَلَا تَقْعُدْ بَعْدَ الذِّكْرَى then do not sit after you have been reminded and you feel the guilty conscience. Mm. So this is a general principle. You can't go and say, I was part, I was just listening. I was a passive observer or passive listener. The Quran has laid down the general principle. If you see someone speaking against the Quran and Hadith, then walk away from there until they choose another topic. And if shaitan makes you forget, then don't sit after you have been reminded. The same thing. There is a hadith al-mustami'u ahad al-mukhtabin that the listener of backbiting is one of the backbiters. Mm. So he also shares in the guna and sin. So by him saying that I will not part, I didn't say it, but you were listening. So what must you do? Well, it's very clear what you must do. If, for example, you find someone backbiting, then very nicely tell him that by this forms part of backbiting, I would appreciate that you don't say anything more. You keep quiet. Or for example, if they don't want to keep quiet, then you walk, walk away. There's nothing wrong in doing so. With respect and dignity, you walk away from that gathering so that you don't become part of the sin. Early on, Mosab, you, you mentioned about the, the hadith al-ghibah to ashaddu min zina And I think one of the interpretations is that uh, the impact and the consequences of gossiping sometimes can be more catastrophic than the, uh, the act of, of, of fornication and, and adultery. People's reputations get sullied. Uh, sometimes certain faults of people become public knowledge and it takes them a lifetime to recover from that. Uh, at times as it gets narrated over and over, it gets spiced up and it gets exaggerated far beyond what uh, the, the original uh, action or the, uh, the original issue really was. I suppose in many times we, we, we're very glib about it. We just speak and we don't realize to what extent it impacts on people's lives. Mm, what, a, what a beautiful point you brought in. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember where I read this, but... Just to give you an example uh, with regard to what you have said, it's in a form of a small incident. And I think the incident, you know, hits the point very hard and very, very accurately. A person one day came to a saintly person and says that, uh, uh, make dua that Allah Ta'ala forgive my sins and part of my sins that I've committed, I've been very, you know, loose and I've been backbiting a lot. Make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives me for the backbiting. So the same person told him, he said, uh, just do me one favor uh, before I make dua for you with regard to Allah forgiving you for backbiting. Uh, go tomorrow and slaughter a chicken, you know, slaughter a halal chicken, Sena approved. <laughs> <laughs> right, go and slaughter the chicken. But what you do, you de-feather the chicken and on your way to me, you scatter the feathers everywhere. So wherever you're coming, you just scatter it randomly on the way when you come to me. And then I will tell you 
with regard to the aspect of asking for forgiveness for the backbiting that you have committed. Mm. So the person did what he was saying, because I mean, this was a saintly person. Whether it be a true incident or a hypothetical tale, see, in our literature, uh, Sheikh Sadi Ramatulali, Jalaluddin Rumi Ramatulali made mention of many, many incidents. Sometimes there was a true incident, sometimes there was a story in which there was a moral, you know, whatever it was, but just look at the moral of the story. So the person did that and he slaughtered the chicken, defeathered the chicken, and on his way to meet the sheikh, whom he had confessed to that he had committed and he had been backbiting people, he scattered the feathers everywhere. So when he came to the sheikh, the sheikh told him, you did what I said? He said, yes. So he said, now, can I ask you to go and pick up all of those feathers that you had randomly scattered when you came here? So he said, it's impossible for me to do so. Where am I going to do that? You didn't tell me that you are going to do mm. a request from me to go and pick up all those feathers. All you did was you told me that uh, go and randomly scatter those feathers. I have scattered it. Where it has gone, I got no idea. And where I'm going to go and pick up all those feathers which I randomly scattered all over. So the sheikh told, me, told him that yesterday you asked me to ask and make dua to Almighty Allah to, Allah Ta'ala to forgive you for backbiting. How am I am going to ask Allah Ta'ala for forgiveness? Go and bring it back from every person who had heard that evil that you have spoken about another person. You have said one to one person, you said it to five person. Those five are going to say, tell it to ten. Ten have gone to send it to fifty. If you want me to ask Allah's forgiveness for the backbiting, then you go and recall and go and bring back wherever that statement of yours have reached. Then I can make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah ta'ala to forgive your backbiting. Now that is a reality. Yeah, profound and thought-provoking. Time for a break. When we come back, inshallah, we continue. Welcome back. So we're talking about the all-important topic of gossiping. In the first two segments of the program, Mawana spoke to us about the definition, what the Quran says, what the Ahadith says, the harms of it, uh, the punishments for it. Uh, the consequences of it we spoke about uh, in the previous segment as well. Some of the motivations, albeit all of them uh, being flawed uh, in as far as why people turn to gossiping. Well, when, when is it justified to talk bad about somebody? Uh, what, you, you get those extreme examples, somebody wants to go and harm somebody else. That it, it goes without saying that you can inform that person that so-and-so wants to do this or so-and-so, you know, you're going to get married to that person. You need to know that they've got these deficiencies or these flaws. But sometimes you get an example, if, if I can uh, mention it, that the husband will say, you know what, I, the boss was just treating me so badly today. I came home and I just needed to vent. And I told my wife whatever I really thought about him. Even though I know it's wrong, it's riba in, in terms of the technical definition that if he had to come to know what I was saying, he wouldn't like it. Or sometimes the wife venting about uh, the neighbor, or about the mother-in-law, about the sister-in-law. I suppose that's where many of the lines get blurred. Sometimes people feel they're either venting or they feel it's a, it's a kind of uh, justified discussion about you know, work-related matters or community-related matters. H how, do we, how do we draw the distinction? Well, I think, I think the aspect of venting is, is, is an aspect that you have to, uh, to bring it and take it into consideration. But I'm sure there must be better ways of venting than to speak bad about someone, and especially mm. when it has been prohibited. Find another way of venting, you know. Take something else, you know, maybe if you really want to take your fist and go and hit someone, <laughs> or go hit, not hit someone, go and knock, knock a board and take a hammer and go and knock a nail on something. But I'm surely they, you, can't, you can't vent in a way that has been prohibited. I think it's very important. Um, maybe in terms of uh, discussing this as uh, with someone who is a counsellor, mm. that would be something that uh, would be permissible because you are now seeking help. And that is part of the reasons where there are these exceptions. What is important is we always re remember exceptions are exceptions. Yeah. They are not the general rule. And if you want to look at uh, exceptions, the ayat of the Holy Quran, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَدَ وَالْدَّمَ وَالْأَحْمَ الْخِنْزِيرِ فَمَنِ اتُّرَ غَيْرَ بَاغِيُ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ You are dying of thirst and there is only a bottle of wine that is in front of you 
or there is only haram meat in front of you, then how are you going to eat it? You're going to eat it with a certain degree of repulsion because we have grown up to be repulsive towards something that is haram. And you are only going to eat to the extent that will save you from dying of hunger or thirst. So if there is an exception, only keep it to the extent of the exception. Of course, there are these exceptions. One of the exceptions, the Quran has made mention, لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم Allah does not like the publicizing of evil. This is another one of the, the great harms and one of the reasons why there is such a great uh, warnings with regard to gossiping. Allah does not like a, a society which is riddled with, with uh, impurity of thought. Mm. Allah likes a society in which there is a purity of thought. So Allah does not like the publicizing of uh, uh, evil. Even there is an ayat in Surah Nur that Allah Ta'ala has made mention that even if there is indecency that has been committed, don't talk about it. Why must you be talking about it? In fact, if you talk about indecency, about someone who has committed indecency, immorality, then you have to bring a witnesses, otherwise you will be punished. So Allah does not like a society in which we talk about evil. Start talking about good. And may Allah Ta'ala reward our brother, brothers in Jamaat. They say, don't talk about the evil things. Hmm. Don't talk about munkar, speak about good. Yeah. So only speak about good, then the society becomes good. The more we speak about evil, that becomes more, th- it thrives more. So one is, if someone has done you wrong, Allah does not like the publicizing of evil, except if you have been wronged. So if someone has done you down, now you've got no outlet with regard to, you know, exposing or to get your rights, then you can make a little bit of a halabu with regard to it. Or you make a noise about it, this one has done me down. He has done this, he has done that. Maybe by you highlighting it, that person will feel ashamed and your rights will be returned back to you. So that is one of it. Uh, one of them is help. And this maybe comes in that not, not just venting for the sake of venting, but of course, sometimes if there is a uh, wife has been abused or vice versa, or there is something, you're going to seek help uh, to the counseling services. Now, when you go there, you are seeking help. So you are speaking uh, the negative aspects of someone, but in what context? You are seeking help. That is also permissible. That is one of the exceptions. Another exception is uh, when you are uh, seeking uh, Islamic ruling. Right now, that also is better not to name the person. Like, for example, if you're asking, now the very famous example our ulama give is that of Haz- uh, Hind. Mm. Hind right? she, she asked about Hazrat Sufyan, uh, Abu Sufyan that she used to take part of his uh, wealth. And she asked Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi when she was asked to pledge allegiance that you will not steal. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes I take from the wealth of Abu Sufyan because he's a miser, he doesn't give me, so can I secretly take from his wealth? You know, now she mentioned something because of seeking a religious ruling. Hmm. Right. Now that was something that everyone came to know. He was just recently and she was just reverting. She was coming into Islam. But if you have to seek a religious uh, verdict, so you can make mention of the evil. That also, we all know that in our Islamic rulings, we use the word Zaid, Bakr, and Amr. Yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, has kept it that way. So, Oja, Zaid, Zaid came, or Zaid did this, and Zaid did that, which of course is a fictional name. So you can get the religious ruling without naming the person, but that is one of the exceptions. And of course, one of the exceptions is when someone comes to you privately to ask about the integrity, the credibility, the conduct and character of someone with whom they are either going to get married or they are going to enter into a partnership. Then there's a hadith, al-mustasharu mu'taminun, that when someone comes to consult with you, then it is a trust upon you to give the best advice possible. Right? There, It's a trust now Hmm. that you must give the best advice. So there you are duty bound. You are responsible. And this, this is also something where people don't find the balance. They know that someone is on drugs, right? But when someone comes and asks that we intend getting married to the someone, they don't make mention of it. You have violated and abused trust. Hmm. In that instance, it was your duty because of the overwhelming good or preventing from the greater harm for you to speak the truth. That this is the reality and this is what I'm going to that say. There you are duty bound. So these are some of the exceptions that the ulama have made mention of. For example, even uh, warning people about the deceptive ways of someone, warning someone with regard to the deceptive ideologies Hmm. that someone is 
propagating. These are some of the exceptions. Do we live in, in, in the age of media today, Moana? And uh, I suppose to some extent uh, we have become desensitized to gossiping because of how it has become prevalent. The Sunday Times used to have that back page and then the Have You Heard section. And it, it's almost like gossip is a, is a standard feature, even on electronic media these days. And then with, with social media, things have become so easy to forward without verifying, without thinking. Uh, you get the, 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 the BC specialist and the forward specialist, anything that come to them, they just uh, dispense of almost like an end mess. Yes. Uh, you know, what, what, what guidelines should, should we be looking at in terms of, of, of media? Uh, you know, and the impact it has on us when it comes to gossiping and also our own role, especially in terms of, of WhatsApp and other forms of social media. Yes, Moana. And then, of course, you justify it by saying, as received. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, this technology is an amazing thing. I, I, I something I'm fascinated with regard to it. Um, you know, there was, I was reading one, one quote somewhere that in 1982, there was one computer mainframe, mainframe for a computer in the entire state of California. Right. And now, almost 40, 50 years after that, we have a situation where there's 100 you know, computers and mainframes in one university. And there was a time there was only one mainframe you know, for the entire state of California. That's the reality. Then I was reading another stats, which was, and it's part of a debate that people are talking about, which is called artificial intelligence. Mm. That they say the intelligence of technology uh, is going to outstrip the intelligence of human beings. So sometime back, I read uh, that in 2023, the intelligence of a computer will be greater than the intelligence of a human being's uh, brain. And then they said by the year 2045, by the year 2045, the artificial intelligence, the intelligence of the computer uh, in 2045 will outstrip the collective intelligence of the entire humanity. But uh, someone, while this was being said, I just, uh, last week I was in a talk in with someone was talking about the artificial intelligence and we said 2023 is, you know, is very far away. Mm. That particular aspect is even more nearer than that. But so yes, this is technology. We have to live with it. But of course, we have to take the good and stay away from the evil. Mufti Shafi Sahib, Rahmatullahi, the Grand Mufti of Pakistan, wrote a very amazing uh, book certain time, certain, you know, years back when he was alive because he termed it Adabul Akbar, the etiquettes of uh, the journalist. And in there, he, he said that... Um, just because you are behind the mic, you are someone who is doing interviews, or you are writing an article to publish in the newspaper, which will be circulated widely, doesn't absolve you from the basic commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said that just because you are a journalist who is very good in writing, or you are a news anchor, or you are an anchor in a talk station, a radio station doesn't absolve you from do not mock at another person because Allah says last year la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa yakunu khayran minhum do not mock another person do not scoff another person do not commit backbiting so just because you are right good in writing you are good in the aspect of speaking behind a microphone does not absolve you from the commands of Allah using that same logic just because you have access to a smartphone that can be see messages on a wide scale mm. does not absolve you from the basic commands of Allah in Ja'akum Fasikum Binaba in Fatabayanu, verify something before you send it out, which will cause harm to the person and will cause harm to your reputation or the reputation of someone else, does not absolve you from the aspect of gossiping and backbiting. It is, it is equal. In fact, I would say it is more serious mm. because previously you used to gossip and when you used to gossip, there was a certain degree of secrecy. Now, do you know what happened? So you speak silently with regard to someone about something. And now, of course, you can do it with disastrous consequences. You can besmirch the reputation of someone with one press of the button. So before you press the button to forward to BC, be extremely careful. Technology is a marvelous thing. Remember this, I, 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 don't, I do not agree with those who just sort of decry and just speak about the, all aspects of technology as being uh, negative. No, no, no. There are aspects of technology which we all benefit from. Mm. I mean the aspect of being connected with the internet to be able at the touch of a button to get such great amount of um, aspects of uh, knowledge is, is a great thing. 
but at the same time, let us stay away from the negative. Well, obviously, this, this is a topic that we, we need to discuss far more often in greater detail, but uh, being almost out of time, uh, in terms of a practical way forward, I think as Muslims, by and large, we know that it's wrong. It's just that it's, it's kind of encroached. It's, it's, it's something that has become uh, so common that we have become desensitized. And this has been a good uh, reminder. And it has shed light on the various perspectives. But practically speaking, what are some of the simple yet important things that we need to do to start removing gossip from our lives? Well, I think the first thing is to realize the harm. You're eating the flesh of your dead brother or sister for that matter. Uh, then of course the aspect of Imam Hassan Basri Rahmatullahi, uh, very famously in the, on the same incident is also referred to Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullahi, uh, when he said that uh, when, when he came to hear about someone, uh, more famously about Imam, Imam Hassan Basri Rahmatullahi, when he came to hear about someone who was backbiting about him, mm. so he sent him sweetmeats, send him like chocolates in today's time, he will say chocolates. You know, send him, and so the person was quite surprised that I, I don't have much love for Hassan Basri. I've been speaking negatively about him, and yet he sent me this. So when he came to find out and try to ascertain why did he say it so, so Imam Hassan Basri Rahmatullahi said that in backbiting there's a transferal of deeds. That means when you backbite about someone, uh, there is a transferal of deeds. Your if that person's evil deeds are transferred to you and your good deeds is transferred to that person. Mm. So Imam Hassan Basri Rahmatullahi told him and said that I heard that you have been backbiting about me. Yeah, I'm sending you sweet meats. Jazakallah. Normally if someone sends you a chocolate, you send a chocolate back in return. You know, and just remember that. <laughs> the viewers can remember that. Uh, uh, we can even make mention of our preference. But anyway, be that may. So he said that you are giving me your good deeds. I'm sending you a gift. Subhanallah, just remember the person whom you are backbiting about. Normally, he, he won't be a very f a favorite in your terms. Uh, he will not be very close to you. Therefore, you are backbiting about him. But can you imagine what you are doing? You are actually giving him your good deeds. That person whom you are speaking negatively about, whom you don't have good feelings towards, you are giving him your good deeds. Yeah. And then, of course, Muhammad Rahmatullahi has also mentioned, he said that when you have the, the curiosity or the, the urge to speak bad about someone, then force yourself to speak the good points about that person. So force yourself, whenever you want to speak and backbite about someone, force yourself to speak about the good, per, the good points of that person, which, of course, everyone will have. So when you do so, then what actually happens is that uh, you will find that... Uh, automatically you will start s stopping yourself from speaking about the negative aspects of that person. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. It's been a very enlightening discussion. Jazakumullah for uh, availing yourself. And inshallah, we'll continue the, the topic on another occasion. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And to the viewers, until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>